When talking about the war on drugs in Mexico, the word cartel gets thrown around a lot. Around the cartels. To keep the cartels. To fight the cartels. Sinaloa, Juarez, Los Zetas, La Familia. The list of names goes on and on. But who are these organizations that have turned Mexican cities into seven of the top 10 deadliest in the world? How did Mexico get to a point where paramilitary drug trafficking networks bring in billions of dollars in revenue, murder tens of thousands of people a year, and often operate as semi-autonomous states within the country? In this episode, we're taking apart who the cartels are and how they went from working together to killing each other. In the late 1970s, cocaine use exploded across America. The main smuggling route was straight from the jungles of Colombia into Florida, as made famous by movies like Scarface and Blow. To disrupt this traffic, in 1982, Ronald Reagan set up the South Florida Task Force under the command of then Vice President George Bush. But for a guy who claimed to love capitalism, when it came to the drug trade, Reagan didn't seem to understand much about how business actually works. Instead of giving up their billion dollar industry because a few shipments had been busted in the Caribbean, the Colombian cocaine producers decided to make use of Mexico's 2,000 mile land border with the US. This is like the narco superhighway. There's actually 300 different smuggling trails right through here. There's no big wall or anything. You can just walk off into the desert with your pack full of cocaine. There were two primary Mexican operators the Colombians went to. The first was Juan Garcia Abrego in Tamaulipas, head of a gang of smugglers whose roots stretched all the way back to alcohol prohibition. They switched over to the drugs trade and the Gulf Cartel was born. The other was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. Gallardo became known as El Jefe del Jefes, or the Boss of Bosses, creating probably the single most powerful organized crime group in Mexican history the Guadalajara cartel. One key issue to remember here is that at this point, none of these organizations actually called themselves cartels. So you have these networks of drug traffickers across Mexico, and for many decades, they're not called cartels, they're simply uh, groups of criminals with you know, buying and selling and uh, forming different alliances and partnerships. So there's a bit of discussion even exactly who coined that phrase. Um, was it actually the Medellin traffickers themselves saying we're a cartel? Or was it actually the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, inventing the word cartel as a way to classify these groups? Now, whether or not it was the DEA who first coined this phrase, it was very useful to the DEA because if you look at the laws, the conspiracy to traffic drugs laws, the racketeering laws, you need to have an organization. So there was an incentive there for the DEA in their communications to say, these are a cartel, it's the Guadalajara cartel, not just the Guadalajara marijuana traffickers. What is clear is that these early Mexican groups, the Guadalajara and Gulf cartels, amassed almost unimaginable wealth and power, transporting thousands of tons of cocaine, heroin, and cannabis into the booming US market. But then they overplayed their hand. In 1985, corrupt officials working for the Guadalajara cartel kidnapped DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarina in broad daylight on the streets of Guadalajara before torturing and murdering him. The gruesome murder of a highly decorated DEA agent was too much, even for the increasingly powerful Mexican traffickers to get away with. Key members of the Guadalajara cartel were arrested, but by this point, the organization had become too big for one man to run. From prison, Felix Gallardo organized a now legendary gangster summit in Acapulco, of which the Guadalajara Empire was divided into separate, smaller cartels. The Juarez Cartel, the Tijuana Cartel, and the Sinaloa Cartel, commanded by Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. The idea was that each of these groups would control their territory, or plaza, and work together to ensure the drugs kept flowing smoothly. In fact, somewhat predictably, what actually happened is that they immediately started fighting each other in a drug war that continues to this day. So as the cartels develop, they have very different structures and ways of doing business and hierarchy. You have some like the Sinaloa cartel, which are more like loose affiliations of businessmen. 
On the other side, you have much more hierarchical pyramidal organizations like the Setas or the Knights Templar with more clear ranks and, and, and command structures going down. By the mid-90s, the leader of the Gulf Cartel, Osiel Cardenas, recruited a group of Mexican special forces who defected and joined him as the armed wing of the Gulf Cartel. So when the Gulf Cartel recruits the former special forces military and they become the Setas, they really change the game of how violence plays out in Mexico. It's full-on paramilitary units, people in bulletproof jackets, metal helmets, radios, AK-47s. And then once the setters do that, everyone has to copy them so it becomes paramilitarized, organized crime in Mexico. In 2003, Osiel Cardenas, the head of the Gulf Cartel, was arrested. Without him in charge, power within the organization gradually shifted to the Zetas themselves. And in 2010, they broke away to form their own cartel, causing a massive spike in violence throughout Tamaulipas which spread through the whole east coast of Mexico. So you have this rising tension between the Setas and the Gulf Cartel masters. And eventually in 2010, you have the Setas and the Gulf Cartel breaking out into open warfare. The Setas separating, becoming their own cartel. And this unleashes some of the worst violence in all of Mexico's cartel conflict. These crazy battles happening along roads with setters against Gulf Cartel operatives and the setters unleashing horrific violence, uh, dragging people out of cars, massacring migrants, carrying out a series of some of the worst atrocities that Mexico will see. When we look at the cartel map of Mexico over time, what we see is essentially a process of fragmentation. Every time the government takes out one cartel, it subdivides into smaller cartels who then fight each other, becoming even more violent as they go on. We can see this play out again and again. The more the government fights, the faster the process accelerates. In Michoacan, after the arrest of its leader, La Familia Michoacana split into Guerreros Unidos, Los Viagras, and most significantly, the Knights Templar, run by Nazario Mourinho Gonzalez, or El Mas Loco, literally the craziest one. Gonzalez ran his cartel like a pseudo-religious cult, forcing his soldiers to carry around a book of his religious teachings. Tenemos el libro de, de El Mas Loco, Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, ahí está su nombre. Es el mismo personaje según Reunía a, a, a sus subordinados y los invitaba a su culto. Repartía vino. Estabas comprometido con los caballeros templarios y firmabas con sangre. In Jalisco, the boss of the Molino cartel was arrested in 2009. The group then split into La Resistencia and, crucially, the Jalisco New Generation cartel, who took after the Zetas in adopting a ruthless paramilitary style and have since started an all-out war with the Sinaloa cartel. I'm a commander here in the region of Michoacán, a commander here in the cartel of Jalisco, new generation. We produce, export and sell drugs. That's what our father does with our money. That's our company for us. The Zetas themselves, the so the Zetas themselves splintered into the so-called old-school Zetas and the cartel del Noreste. While El Chapo was finally locked up in a U.S. maximum security prison in 2019, the Sinaloa Federation has lost none of its power. When the Mexican army tried to arrest El Chapo's son later that year, hundreds of heavily armed cartel gunmen poured into the streets and didn't stop shooting until the government backed down and released him. The government is stuck with this impossible choice. If you leave these kingpins, you're allowing impunity and allowing, allowing them to become more powerful. If you take them down, you're seeing the cartels fragment and seeing more violence happen. The shifting and changing map of Mexican cartel power has been accompanied by grotesque violence. In 2007, after the first year of Calderon's war on drugs, the murder rate was 8,122. By 2020, it had rocketed to over 34,000. After all this bloodshed, have the drugs stopped flowing over the border? No. More Americans are getting high on drugs that have passed through Mexico than ever before. 
In fact, what we see after tracing all this back over a hundred years is that pretty much every time the US and Mexican governments have tried to stamp out the drug trade, it's made the situation more violent, and the Mexican people have paid the price. We'd like to congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs.